Hello and welcome to the Gnostic Warrior Podcast, broadcasting from GnosticWarrior.com in San Diego, California, to around the world. I'm your host, Mo, and today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with Paul Weston. Paul is a prolific author of nine books, a lecturer and tour guide from Glastonbury, the mystical capital of Britain. His work covers 34 years of transformational ideas from both Western and Eastern esoteric paths. In this podcast, Paul discusses his theories on the Interplane radio station, an intelligence in which people like Carl Jung, Aleister Crowley, Jack Parsons, and even Weston himself taps into, Carl Jung's collective unconscious. I have written about this type of internet before that consists of filaments in the dark matter that surrounds us in a paranormal type of etheric force field that we interact with and plug into like a radio station. Paul goes deep into Jung, Crowley, and Parsons territory, so you're not going to want to miss this special podcast. But before we begin, I have a word from our sponsor. With the coronavirus wreaking havoc on the world and all the other harmful bacterias, viruses, and molds to worry about, disinfectants and cleaners are selling off the shelves and selling out in stores across the globe. But I have good news for you. There is a special stock of pure hydrogen peroxide disinfecting cleaner waiting just for you, which is one of the most powerful, safest, and greatest products to keep you and your family safe during this virus outbreak. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, recommends you use a disinfectant such as hydrogen peroxide to kill 99.9% of the pathogens like the coronavirus. You can easily buy pure hydrogen peroxide disinfectant cleaner online by the gallon or in handy spray bottles today. And if you put in the code 33, you will get 20% off of your order. Again, use code 33 and get 20% off pure hydrogen peroxide disinfectant cleaning products. To get your bottle today, go to purehydrogenperoxide.com. Again, that is purehydrogenperoxide.com. And now it's time for the Gnostic Warrior Podcast. Good day, Paul. How you doing? Hi there, Mo. Good to be talking to you from Glastonbury, UK. It's great to have you on the podcast. You know, this is the first time that we have spoke with one another. And maybe there's some people out there that have not heard about you. And why don't you give us a quick uh, rundown on your, your history and your path until now, Paul? Okay, sure. Well, I've been interested in a wide spectrum of the Eastern and Western mystery tradition for decades now. You know, I'm nearly 61 and this is stuff that I've been into since I was was a teen. I had a lot of interest in in ufology. I certainly uh, went down the psychedelic route. I did a degree in the study of comparative religion at university, which enabled me to actually do a dissertation on, on Nazi occultism back in 1983, which was quite interesting. Got myself into Gurdjieff, Colin Wilson, Crowley, all this kind of stuff. And... In 1988, I met the historical mysteries researcher, Andrew Collins, who's a pioneer of what he was calling psychic questing, which is a very interactive thing where you go out into a landscape, you use synchronicities and visions and mystical magical techniques to maybe investigate historical enigmas and strange outlandish paranormal stuff tended to go down that was way above the norm and this helped to mutate my consciousness and i've been in glastonbury for 25 years now and in that amount of time um put out a lot of lectures a lot of information on stuff that has come to life while i've been writing about it as i hope that i'll be able to uh, give a few examples of the subject matter that we're going to be going into tonight and tell us a little bit about Glastonbury for the people around the world that might not know about that location. Tell us about the the mystical and occult origins and everything surrounding that place. Okay, well, Glastonbury can readily be called the mystical capital of Britain. It's, it's New Age Central on the one hand. It's, 
if you want an American reference point, it could be maybe somewhere in, in the realm of the likes of Sedona. But what we've got here that's kind of unique is a very, very strong, powerful uh, Christian history full of saints and, and mystics and a huge abbey that was here that was destroyed by Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. Uh, the abbot here was hung, drawn and quartered in the vicinity. There's a whole bunch of stuff that hangs in the airways relating to that. But our most notable landscape uh, icon is Glastonbury Tour, which is a 500 foot tall uh, natural but slightly shaped hill with a, a ruined church tower on top of it, which vibes outwards uh, with a very strong pagan charisma. If you can actually say that uh, something in a landscape, a landmark has got charisma and somehow communicates to you, uh, plenty of people would say that about the tour. So we've got an ongoing global uh, pilgrimage scenario going on here um, all the year round. You know, people coming here, having visionary experiences, having all sorts of revelatory things going down for them on their pilgrim path. Um, I'm very fortunate to be a tour guide here and to actually sometimes be able to uh, help facilitate some of these processes. It's very moving when that actually happens and people, you know, kind of standing at some holy well with tears in their eyes as a result of, of being drawn here. For Americans, um, I think Marion Zimmer Bradley's Mist of Avalon, the pagan retelling of, of the story of, of Alf and in the Alfurian stories, that's drawn an awful lot of people over the Atlantic to here. It all hangs in the airwaves in a very unique manner. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, it definitely sounds more like a, a mystical and, and a divine presence there rather than a, an evil one. And you've lived there and you've experienced these these alleged holy sites. Would you, would you say that is true? This is a uniquely powerful place. Um, the gnosis is of both the light and the dark. The, uh, um, when I start talking about Abraxas and, and Yule, um, what, he's, what he says about that, I feel is very true of Glastonbury. Um, in the summertime, it's like a paradisiacal, apple oil, other world paradise. Um, when it gets to the dark side of the wheel of the year, well, people that have lived there a while, I think everyone that stays there um, goes through some very, very deep and sometimes not entirely comfortable processes. But there is a sense of some remarkable higher intelligence that is on the case and that enables one to handle things that perhaps in other circumstances would just be too much. Yeah, we'll be getting into that too, Paul. So let's discuss, you know, you're a prolific writer the author of, of nine books, and you've written about various occult, interesting subjects throughout time. And so let's start, there's Carl Jung, Aleister Crowley, and Jack, Jack Parsons. And uh, I believe you want to start out with uh, Jung or with Crowley? Yeah, yeah. Let's, um, being as Crowley is, is the, the common factor going through what I'm going to say about Jung and also about, about Jack Parsons. We'll start there because because the whole focus on Jung is within the context of, of Crowley and what expands into a larger context of what we might call the, the Gnostic revival that began, you know, at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. So I'll start with 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 Alistair Crowley. And okay. we all know, of course, that he's, he's the most notorious occultist of the 20th century. And the centre of gravity of his whole life's work is a mysterious episode that occurred in Cairo in 1904 when, according to himself, the old epoch, the old Christian era of the dying and resurrected God, a whole formula by which the world had been governed, all of this went up in flames on the inner planes. And a new era, that he called the era of Horus, uh, which was no longer governed by either a, a father or a mother god, but by the individual will of the crowned and conquering child had been ushered in. And the sign of that was that over a three-day period, his wife had gone into an old state of consciousness, started transmitting messages to him, told him to be prepared uh, in a hotel room over three days for something to happen. And, and supposedly chapters, three chapters of what came to be called the Book of the Law were audibly dictated. Both he and his wife could hear the voice from a secret chief that was known as Iwas um, dictating this thing. Now, of course, this is controversial. There is contention as to how much Crowley account is is 
is true, distorted, whatever. But from our point of view, what matters is if this thing is even remotely true, what he's saying, then we would expect other people uh, in their own way, from their own work and perspective, to get a waft of it and to express something that we could recognise, yeah, this is the same sort of thing. Now, being as, as young is, is perhaps most famous for introducing to a wider audience the idea of a collective unconscious and archetypes, you know, constellations of ideas with emotional energy attached to them that come round in cycles and rise up above the horizon in, in, in the human psyche. If anyone is going to get a waft of this, then surely it's going to be him. And to my own satisfaction, there is an episode in Jung's life, uh, just less than 10 years after, Crow just over 10 years after Crowley's revelation, which when investigated, uh, seems to me to be a uh, broadcast from the, the same mysterious inner plane radio station. In 1916, um, Jung is in a situation where um, in his family home, uh, a tremendously strange atmosphere builds up. It appears to be haunted. There are poltergeist type phenomena going on. Uh, a doorbell is ringing. There's nobody there. His children are having very strange dreams about angels and demons. Uh, and by his own account, the air is, is thick with ghosts. And he cries out, you know, for, for, for God's sake, what in the world is this? And he then says, a chorus of voices replied, we have come back from Jerusalem where we found not what we sought. Now, the frustrating thing is that Jung doesn't have quite as much to say about the detail of the whole situation as Crowley does about his own experience. But what we do know is that he sets out over three days and writes in a way that we could call, essentially call automatic writing because it's not coming from his normal conscious self. Seven sermons to the dead. And the authorship is attributed to uh, someone called Basilides, who is a historical character. We know this person was a Gnostic teacher from Alexandria from around about early second century AD. And he's associated with a very strange um, god form called Abraxas, who is usually depicted as um, a strange being, usually with a rooster head, sometimes with a lion head, sometimes with a hawk head, um, in a chariot, um, holding a whip and a shield, it's sun and a moon in the sky uh, behind him, indicating that he embodies opposites. And Jung writes this work attributed to Basilides. We don't know whether he considers that he's, he's essentially channeling Basilides. We don't know quite what it means. But whatever the case, the actual work that we're left with, the Seven Sermons, is a very, very powerful piece of work. Um, if I'll string together just a few of the things across its, its various sections that are said about Abraxas. Abraxas is undefinable life itself which is the mother of good and evil alike. He's the brightest light of day and the deepest night of madness. He is both the radiance and the dark shadow of man. Abraxas generates truth and falsehood, good and evil, light and darkness with the same word and in the same deed. Therefore, Abraxas is truly the terrible one. He's the monster of the underworld, the octopus with a thousand tentacles. He is the twistings of winged serpents and of madness. To fear him is wisdom. Not to resist him means liberation. Now, Jung is a guy that most people will know as a, some kind of psychologist, a strange one, but essentially a psychologist. He deals with people who, who come to talk to him about their what's going on for them. He helps them out. This seems like a very strange, full on occult episode. So how does this all come about? You know, this I, be I began to become aware was not something that had come out of a vacuum. You know, this is in 1916. There's actually about three years that lead into this. And the more I investigated it, the more points of contact there were with, with Crowley's experience. Crowley's claimed that 
the voice that dictated this whole message to him, this secret chief, Iwas, as he was called, uh, was a kind of um, his holy guardian angel, if you like. This was, this was the terminology that he used. Now, back in 1913, uh, Jung had started to deliberately cultivate uh, through what Jungians call active imagination, um, inner visionary experiences. And a figure appeared to him who he called uh, Philemon, who was this white-bearded, robed sage with, with multicolored kingfisher wings. And Jung described him as having an Egypto-Hellenistic atmosphere with a Gnostic coloration. And as, a, as, as an, an event that you could say was typical of, of what he later came to call synchronicity, he shortly after this initial um, vision, if you like, uh, found a dead kingfisher, which was very, very um, rare in the vicinity of, of his Swiss home at the time. And he never saw another one in, in all the decades that, that he was there. And this Philemon becomes a kind of inner guru to Jung. He guides him through times of visionary experiences where he's verging on psychosis. There was a tremendous amount of inner upheaval in Jung in the period round about the time that the First World War uh, began. So Jung later formulates his, his ideas of the components of the psyche. He talks about the wise old man. Occultists might call this function that Philemon um, serves as a, an inner plane context. One way or another, he serves as what you might call as, as the conduit for the, uh, the incoming Basilides of Braxis transmission. But there's, there's something even a lot more striking um, because these visions in 1913 were undoubtedly shaped by his extensive reading on, on the mystery cults, and in particular Mithraism, which was an enduring fascination um, of Jung's. And in that early, um, early centuries AD, what I could call the Alexandrian Hermetic era, Mithras had become really successful in the Roman world, and it was a very syncretistic synthetic kind of um, climate where lots of different god forms sort of blended together. So Mithras and Abraxas and also Eon, who is a god of time, uh, they all kind of hang together. And, and indeed, um, you know, Crowley uses a variant spelling of Mithras, uh, claiming that that was uh, the, the original meaning of, of the idol Baphometra, uh, worshipped by the Templars, but but anyway, yeah, Crowley, no, it, a graduate of the Golden Dawn, and in the Golden Dawn, they've got a, a technique called the assumption of a god form. And what that means is that you close your eyes and imagine that you have the appearance of some deity. So, for example, with an Egyptian god, you would sit in the same posture that you've seen a statue of it. You imagine that you're, you've got the animal head. You imagine that you're, you're holding various artifacts, that you're dressed in a particular way. And Crowley had often taken on the form of Horus during his Golden Dawn days. And he feels that this helps prepare him for what we call the Cairo revelation. Now, perhaps the most astonishing experience of Jung's whole life has only really become... Uh, more widely known in about the last 20 years uh, for a book called The Aryan Christ by a guy called Richard Knoll. He's quite critically young, but I read his book and, and still found myself entirely undiminished in my interest in enthusiasm. He shows us how, and this is from Jung's own, own papers, uh, one night in December 1913, in a state of this active imagination, Jung starts to experience a snake wrapping itself around his body. And as he does so, he, he kind of spontaneously takes on a crucifixion pose and he feels his head changing shape into that of a lion. Now, this from his reading in the Mithraic mystery cults, he knows is, is what is called the Leontocephalic, meaning lion headed, Cosmocrator, the ruler of the cosmos, the lord of time, Eon. And he achieves such an intensity as to experience a total identification. This is his own words, deification. In this deification mystery, he says, you make yourself into the vessel and are a vessel of creation in which the opposites reconcile. 
So Eon, the lion-headed god with the snake round his body, again represents the union of opposites, light and dark, male and female, creation and destruction. As you, that was Jung's own words. So it's an initiatory experience. So this is the scene being set for this seven sermons thing. You know? Now, one of the characteristics of, of the Abraxas in the Gnostic time is that there are gemstones that are, are, are a widely um, disseminated cultural thing called the Braxis gems. And they sometimes have other um, god forms on them, like the infant form of Horus, Hippocrates. They sometimes have a Braxis with a hawk's head. They have, have Jewish god names like Jehovah on them. They have names that we associate with, um, with the Gnostic god forms like Iao. But Abraxas, as Hippocrates, as as the young, the young form of Horus, is is now linking us in with with Crowley's Book of the Law, and this is as defining a moment for you as Cairo in 1904 for Crowley. But the difference is, Jung never goes public with this really until the very end of his life when he, he says a little bit about all this in memories dreams reflections there's only there's only one exception to this which i'll discuss a bit later but hardly anyone knows about this so copies of it are disseminated to a few people it's understood that the, the novelist herman hesse might have had a look at it um he ends up writing about abraxas he may well have seen it but crowley goes on and on about it for decades with Jung, it's this secret um core of, it, of his work when we start to look again, you know, things that, that Crowley has to say and Jung has to say, there's, a, there's another inspired book by Crowley in about 1907. And, he, you know, just a, a short quote here. Oh, ye toads and cats rejoice, ye slimy things come hither. Dance, dance to the Lord our God. And here's the seven sermons to the dead. He is the lord of toads and frogs who live in water and come out onto the land and who sing together at high noon and at midnight. It's like they, they've got, they're somewhere on the same page here. And this kind of is, it comes out quite strongly um, in Crowley's own version of uh, a famous 19th century, what's called a fragment of a Greco-Egyptian work upon magic, which... He was used by the Golden Dawn. Golden Dawn chief Samuel Little, Little McGregor Mavis made use of it as a general invocation. But Crowley uh, put together all these what they call barbarous names of evocation, strange words that don't seem to have any meaning, but seem to carry the resonance of archaic deities and, and are all part of the Alexandrian period of time. He works his own version of this out called uh, Liber Samic. And in Liber Samic, um, he actually uses um, the, the term Abraxas. And he talks of Abraxas as being of the flavour of the Ian Horus. And one of the things that you have to do um, in at the different four directions is to imagine yourself in the form of particular deities. And in the, in the south, the elemental god of the quarter, it's a solar phallic lion, you know. Uh, uh, so Crowley is actually saying in this ritual to invoke your holy guardian angel that when you come to contemplate the energies of the south, the fire in the south, you imagine yourself in the form of a solar phallic lion. And you, one of the words that you utter is that of a Braxis, which he explains actually means of the father, the son, uh, of the spell of the Eonahorus. So again, to me, this is this is all somewhere on the same page. Um, I'm not in any doubt at all about the fact that these guys are, are transmitting something. Now, when I came to this, you know, I'll tell a personal story now of the potency um, of how all this this hangs together. I mean, it's an intellectual adventure in your head to sort of put all this stuff together, but. Does anything else happen? You know, this is magic. This is very, we're talking about two very powerful people, Crowley and Jung, having these incredibly intense psychoactive experiences that are the centre of gravity of, of their entire life. I mentioned Andrew Collins earlier on. Um, and he's somebody that used to come down and visit Glastonbury on a New Year's Eve. And we kind of do something or another. 
And in 2002 to three, uh, he contacts me and he said that he picked up a very interesting item, which was uh, a foot tall figurine statuette of a Braxis um, in the form of, of a rooster headed deity. It's ithyphallic. It's got a big stonking stiffy on it. And he says, well, you know, what can we do in Glastonbury with this thing? Now, I happen to know from the history of the Abbey that one of the early medieval abbots, a guy called Sefrid Pomotion, who had later moved on to, uh, to Chichester in Kent, when he was, uh, corpse had been disinterred there in the 60s, they found one of these mysterious Abraxas rings on him. And even though I knew that there were some arguments about whether it really was him or not, there was just this hint of heresy. You know, we know that a lot of churchmen at that time, which is quite mysterious, even one of the popes uh, used to wear these Gnostic rings, 11th, 12th century. I, I love the idea that there was a bit of Gnostic heresy maybe present in Glastonbury Abbey, that there was a waft of a Braxis. So I said, I'll tell you what we can do. We'll go in Glastonbury Abbey on New Year's Day and we'll put this statue um, on an altar there in a ruined chapel uh, that's dedicated to the Virgin Mary, and I'll read out some of Jung's seven sermons to the dead. Now, this is quite a kind of tricky thing because it's a public place. There's a lot of people in there. You run the risk of, of being pretty controversial and maybe upsetting a few people if you're sticking uh, a weird uh, ithyphallic rooster-headed statue on an altar there. But we managed to get away with it. I felt that it was a heretical thing. Uh, I didn't think it was in any way blasphemous because of the fact that I'm in there all the time and I'm very psychoactive with it. And there were so many people about, I thought, for on a wrong one, then somebody's just going to come along and we won't be able to do it. But we were able to do it and it was very weird and it was very powerful. And I thought, well, OK, that's that. But at the time I was working... Um, as a head of the manager of a warehouse for a local uh, business called Speaking Tree, who deal with mind, body, spirit books, remainder books. It's probably quite a lot of shops known to your listeners in the States who probably have got some books from Speaking Tree over the years. So we had half a million books in there, and we were getting books in and out of there every day. And a fortnight later, in the early part of January 2003, uh, some books turned up. There was one on Yule. And for some totally unknown reason, I don't know why, I looked up Glastonbury in the index. I, did, I had no idea, nothing to really back up the idea that it would even be mentioned. But it was mentioned. And it suggested that Jung had actually visited Glastonbury. Now, I've been in a Jung, at that point I first got into Jung in 1978. So I'd been into him for decades. I'd read pretty seriously. I'd read some big stuff, you know, psychology and alchemy and Eon. I'd, I'd all the usual stuff, big biographies of him. I had no idea he'd ever come to Glastonbury. And this book set me off, and shortly after that, I, I anchored the information that he had indeed come to Glastonbury in April 1939 with his wife on a tour of various sacred places in the West Country. Now, his wife, Emma, uh, some of your, your listeners may know that she was a great student of the Grail Mystery. She wrote a whole book on the Grail and indeed Jung held back a little bit on um, writing about it to quite the extent he might have done to let her get on with it. But they were in Glastonbury and I, I knew where they stayed. It was in a, a place called Copper Beach, which is now a block of flats and used to be an inn. It's right next to the, the Catholic Church here. It's literally just over the road from the Abbey. And the guy, the people that brought him here, there was a guy called uh, Heston Baines, who was also known as Peter Baines. Now, I said that nobody knew about Seven Servants to the Dead in Jung's lifetime. There was one British translation made of the text in 1925, and it was not attributed to Jung. Nothing was said about how this text had originated or where it came from. It's just Basilides, Abraxas, the Seven Sermons. And this was actually translated by Heston Peter Baines. So Jung has actually been brought to Glastonbury by the guy that has, that has produced the English version of Seven Sermons to the Dead that I've been reading from. And during that period of time, Jung also uh, used to wear uh, a Gnostic gem, an Abraxas gem, and there's quite a few photos of him during that time where you'll see it on his finger. He and his wife, Emma, you know, there is no way they didn't go in Glastonbury Abbey. There's no way 
and they wouldn't have gone downstairs where I was. There is no way that they literally would not have been standing within feet of where I recited the words from Seven Sermons to Dead. And I never had the slightest idea of that at all until I had actually done that. And this came back on me full tilt within a matter of, of weeks. And that, to me, just affirmed the psychoactive power of what I was doing. And, you know, a lot came out of that, believe me. Uh, it's still active. You know, this is like over 15 years ago now, and I still consider it to be one of the most potent things uh, that I've done while I've been here. And it just affirmed for me that I was not wrong in, in somehow plugging in, um, you know, to this Seven Sermons material. So that's, you know, that's the young side of it. I'll pause there. Yeah, yeah. And let me, you know, you, you made an interesting comment that really caught my ear. You said interplane radio station uh, when you were referring to Crowley and, and Jung and, and this Abraxas kind of connection where they're connecting to this this ethereal intelligence, we could say. And then, you know, here you are in Glastonbury and you have somewhat this spiritual experience where you're finding out one of the um, people that you're writing about and you have this, you know, profound interest in for decades was also in the very spot that you were at, um, possibly, and, and there's a high probability that he was, you know, and you're kind of connected in this intelligence and this interplane kind of radio station. And what's interesting is science now is is verifying that we are all connected through, you know, this dark matter. There are these filaments. And I think in time we're going to find out that we are connected and through these various planes we're connected to these intelligences. And I, I think it's going to become more true. And our ancestors who had built these holy places, I feel that they um, are somewhat conduits for it. And especially when powerful people such as Jung, um, Crowley, we could say, and, and yourself, uh, go into them, and I, I think we act as those conduits because we're we're especially awake to them. Cause so I, so that's kind of my theory, um, and then also I believe the internet kind of plays a role in that now, and it's the, we're putting the it on. Intensified it. There's no question about the fact that the synchronicity and so forth is is far more um, likely to occur when you're just being bombarded with enormous amounts of potentially diverse information, moment to moment. Sure. But in terms of how that plays out, you know, um, my experience with Jung and the Seven Sermons and the Abbey and the timing of it and so forth, uh, the emotional tone of it, the mystery, it is literally, you know, I use the word mystery in, in the sense of mysterium, in the sense of the mystery cults of the ancient world. There is a sense that you are being drawn across some threshold when it's something that is that big and that weird and, and the nature of it. And indeed, you know, these, these, these things about Abraxas, as Jung states them, are, are true on a very deep level of, of the mysterious light and dark gnosis that, that plays out to, to at least some of us here in Glastonbury. I'm not a, an expert, but I've, I've read a lot of Crowley stuff. I've, I've read Jung as well. I lean more towards Jung. I feel he was a Gnostic as opposed to Crowley, seemed to get more in the libertine side of it and, and explore it to the extremes and maybe he opened himself to energies where it seemed like he went to those dark sides more than 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 Jung did. Sure, what do I you think, say about that? I think in some cases uh, the mysterious false, if you like, the overseeing intelligences behind these things in the bigger scale of the turning of the heavenly cycles require certain types of human agency in order for their mystery to be expressed across the full spectrum. So you have these extreme types. You have people like Crowley, and we'll, we'll get on to Jack Parsons a little later. He's another absolutely unique individual. Whereas Jung has, I mean, Jung's has this stability of family life. You know, he's, he's, he's got this enduring marriage, he's got these children, but let's not forget also that he has long-term affairs with a lot of other women um, he is quite wild in his own way, but he does manage to somehow make it work. Uh, there's no question that there's, there's a fair amount of, of casualties strewn along the way in Crowley's life. Uh, but, but with Jung, you know, there is something that you, you can say is 
more of a message for a wider spectrum of people. You know, the people that he dealt with were by no means normal. When you look into the kind of the social strata, the cultural background that the people that went into therapy with him represent, they were a, a, a pretty well-read, you know, interesting bunch of people. Um, but there's still something that is there for uh, a far wider um, spectrum of, of humanity uh, than what you might call, um, you know, Crowley stuff, even, even though the law is for all, as he said, and the basic tenet of the new eon, do what thou wilt, should be the whole of the law, and every man is, and woman is a star, is unique in their own orbit. That's something we can all take on board, but it's not everybody's temperament to want to um, get involved in the Western magical mystery tradition you know, um, get into the Kabbalah and the tarot and robes and invocations and this, that and the other. Whereas Jung, obviously, um, the message goes out a lot further. People that are artistic, that are creative in whatever field have all responded, you know, to his ideas. And it, it's, it has literally, his personality and his work has gone into the very collective unconscious that he discussed. Uh, and has helped people, you know, through having new terminology, new ideas, new ways of, of responding to things to actually deal with this enormous great shift, you know, which so obviously occurred in the 20th century of the two world wars. Um, yeah, the, we could, we we could say, LSD, yeah, then, so on. yeah, then Crowley could have uh, been on the opposite side of the coin where, he influenced, you know, the kind of the rock and roll generation, the the liberal side of the coin. W would you say that's true? Where he had a strong influence there. He certainly did. Yeah. I mean, the romance of the libertine lifestyle, you know, and the psychedelic drugs and so forth um, is obviously something that people that are leading an extreme life can can identify with and can find something in that can potentially help them. But, you know, Jung's quite big uh in the 60s as well um not in the same way but he, he's there you know he's definitely there and his influence on thinking about for example um ufos uh, it's very very intriguing that virtually the last thing he ever writes is, is flying saucers and the fact that he identifies the fact that there is a psychic component to this phenomenon that it's not separate from our consciousness has, I feel, been very useful in some of the most productive, the most useful work on that subject, to me anyway. But that's a, that's a, another enormous great great thing that could take us else, elsewhere. But from a basic point of view of Gnosis, you know, both Jung and Crowley represent um, the very, very strong dynamic in the 20th century that we are, are able to have our own experiences um, of the divine, of inspiration, of the things that we need to bring out the best in ourselves. And we don't necessarily have to give over to some state cult and some state specialists to do that. We can take the examples, the biographies of some of these extreme figures and the, the, you know, the great cartographers of consciousness uh, and, and get quite a lot of mileage out of that. You know, so Jung and Crowley represent with Seven Sermons, with the Book of the Law, to me, they're both expressions of the same thing, which is a, a returning above the horizon of a way of thinking and being in the world that disappeared at the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. And this is where, you know, the mystery of the Babylon working and Philip K. Dick and so on um, comes along to further enhance our understanding of that. Do you believe that they're all tapping this, you know, at Jung? His theory of the collective un unconscious, that's this interplane uh, radio station maybe that you talk about? Yeah, and um, what you say, what Jung says uh, in Flying Saucers, which I think is very, very interesting, is, is that there are literally ideas which deep, dip below the psychic horizon, like, like stars that, you know, fall from, from the sky and are below the horizon and they rise again. And at the changeover of astrological epochs literally you know ideas ways of thinking and feeling that had, had disappeared below the horizon start to rise again inside our heads now a lot of these ideas we're discussing they go they're there as a subterranean current 
through the Middle Ages, through, you know, the Renaissance is full of Hermeticism and so on. But it seems like um, it's only in the end of the, the 19th century, particularly in the 20th century, that what we would recognise as, as Gnosticism really comes back out again. And, and, you know, this is actually accentuated by the fact that you've got the extraordinary Nagamadi discovery uh, within months of of the nukes um, in Japan in 1945, and you know this is something that I'll go into further uh, when we're talking about about um, Jack Parsons and, and Philip K. Dick. That it is literally uh, there is a, there are cycles. Uh, the, these things can be understood as as things that somehow come back into consciousness, and as I say, different people with different temperament respond to them in a different way but the more we become aware of the fact that maybe something like this is happening it helps when we can see to what extent we may be on the same page because then there's you know our communication possibilities and what we can actually do with all this uh, are enhanced with the coronavirus wreaking havoc on the world and all the other harmful bacterias viruses and molds to worry about Disinfectants and cleaners are selling off the shelves and selling out in stores across the globe. But I have good news for you. There is a special stock of pure hydrogen peroxide disinfecting cleaner waiting just for you, which is one of the most powerful, safest, and greatest products to keep you and your family safe during this virus outbreak. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, recommends you use a disinfectant such as hydrogen peroxide, to kill 99.9% of the pathogens like the coronavirus. You can easily buy pure hydrogen peroxide disinfectant cleaner online by the gallon or in handy spray bottles today. And if you put in the code 33, you will get 20% off of your order. Again, use code 33 and get 20% off pure hydrogen peroxide disinfectant cleaning products. To get your bottle today, go to purehydrogenperoxide.com. Again, that is purehydrogenperoxide.com. Yeah, and I agree with you. The the gnosis, I believe, had really expanded in the 19th, 20th century, and here we are in the 21st century moving on, and it seems to um, be exploding in the knowledge that is spreading through the the internet through the phone lines through our our smartphones you know and at the same time they seem to be making some of us uh, dumber some of us are de-evolving some would say they're they're dumb phones and they're making us not be able to really be true gnostics we could say or or whatever your path might be it's interesting it's that discrimination there's no doubt about that and 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 to understand um, in Gurdjieffian terms uh, what food nourishes you and what you know what impressions essentially poison you that out of all of this uh, you have the free will to select to bring towards yourself to magnetize the influences that are best for you and yeah. by the time you, you've got a little way into adulthood by the time you're about 30 so if you don't know what's good for you by then and what's bad for you, then, you know, you've definitely got a problem. You should have already uh, uh, had the inner resources to understand what is nourishment and what is poison. It will vary. It will vary with people. But the broad principle of what makes you more conscious, you know, better integrated, uh, you know, serves right across the spectrum. Definitely. And and again, we're pretty much uh, have the liberty to pursue uh, whatever that might be. And some of us pursue uh, what wouldn't be more dark and degrading things for for us and ourselves and our families, and then some choose higher. And I, I believe that you do attract these things like a magnet. What you concentrate on as well. So it's interesting that you we have these two prolific guys. Then it leads up to Jack Parsons, and they're um, they're not even connected. Jung did Jung know Crowley at all? They, that Crowley knew of Jung's work and and quoted it. Uh, Jung cannot fail to have been aware of Crowley because Crowley was so notorious in the 1920s, uh, but he would would not have considered that, you know, this was something to particularly um, 
pay any attention to. You know? Of course. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I, and that's understandable. And how does this, this all lead up to Jack Parsons? He's definitely someone who is very interesting and not a lot of people know about him. So can you introduce the audience to the infamous occult scientist, Jack Parsons? Yeah. Well, okay, in recent years, because of the TV series Strange Angel, uh, Parsons has become increasingly well known. It's a shame that that show uh, had so much in it that was outright fiction because the general world building, the sense of that period of time, the style of it was pretty damn good. Basically, Jack Parsons, I think there's a, uh, uh, the writer on a culture, uh, Richard Metzger, called Jack Parsons the James Dean of the occult, and I think that's a pretty damn good designation because here's, here's a guy who is... Killed in an explosion when he's barely in his 30s. He's a rocket scientist. He's, he's involved in creating the fuel that's later used uh, for the space shuttle. He's got a, a crater on the dark side of the moon named after him. He's somebody that played a role uh, in the end of the Second World War by assisting the creation of something called Jet, jet Assisted Takeoff, which is basically a boost for planes on aircraft carriers that, uh, uh, that enables them to take off with less uh, space in which to do it. And on that basis, you know, he's given contracts by the government. You know, he's a pioneer. He's one of the first guys to get rockets um, actually into the stratosphere. Uh, and, and yet he's a playboy. He's, he's a good-looking guy. He's like film star handsome. He's a babe magnet, and he's also a total libertarian, and he's completely and utterly dedicated to the magic of Alistair Crowley, which he considers to be libertarian to the absolute nth degree. And towards the end of the war, he's managed to rent out this old mansion uh, in Pasadena, and he's deliberately filled it with a whole weird bunch of eccentric characters like um you know organists from silent movie era and fortune tellers and he hosts a whole gathering of of early science fiction writers he's hanging out with these kind of people and at the same time he's pursuing crowdian magic um on a very very serious uh, manner and it's in um august 1945 that Elron Hubbard turns up at this mansion. And this is obviously pre-Scientology, Ron. And they hit it off and conceive of this idea to do um, an ongoing ritual. This is not just something you do in one day, but something that takes place over, over weeks to invoke a force called Babylon. Now, Babylon is not spelt the same as the city of Babylon. It's B-A-B-A-L-O-N. And this is a crowded term for a very fierce form of goddess that he kind of encountered um, way back in, in 1910 and continued to write about after that. And in Crowley's um, conception, uh, it's linked together with... Um, Goddesses of the ancient world, uh, like Ishtar, like Inanna, like Aphrodite, um, who have been linked in accounts which are, are controversial now concerning sacred prostitution and so on. They're a false in which, you know, sexual energy is very, very present, but there's also something very fierce and initiatory about them, uh, a little bit like Kali, perhaps, and the feeling that Parsons has, because he's hanging out with people that were part of the Manhattan Project, you know, he knows some of these people. This is just after the bombs. This is a time when Crowley said that the old world has gone up in flames on the inner plane and a new world that's going to be characterized by ferocious warfare, overseen by the Egyptian god of war, Horus, or a form of Horus called Rahul Kiri, is now, um, you know, the governing force of mankind. By then, we've had two world wars. We've had the utter horrors of Hiroshima. Parsons feels that this force is kind of unbalanced and needs uh, a female equivalent uh, to bring it um, to some kind of harmony. I mean, a fierce enough form, but he sets about with Ron Hubbard engaging in these series of rituals. And a woman turns up almost um, immediately called Marjorie Cameron, who's an extraordinary witch woman artist in her own right 
And she gets involved in this sex magic with, with Jack Parsons. And it's a famous story that I don't need to go too much into that Ron Hubbard um, absconds with a, a large sum of money, uh, that a whole bunch of stuff goes wrong. Um, now, the thing that gets really interesting about this is that, you know, Parsons goes out at the climax of this thing. This is, is February 1946. They start it um, in January 1946. In February, Parsons goes out to the Mojave Desert on his own. Something weird happens to him out there, and he comes back with what he considers to be the fourth chapter of, of the Book of the Law, that he's somehow completed it, and it's the Book of Babylon. And there's, he's also written some poems about Babylon and, and, and so forth. And after Parsons leaves, um, after Hubbard goes off of his money and leaves Parsons, his, his life goes into a bit of a nosedive. But it's not the end because there's some more stuff that comes about that really clues us into this, this Gnostic side. And this is, is in 1948 now. And it's a Halloween and he decides that he's got to go on what he calls a black pilgrimage, which is, is some kind of crossing of the abyss where he, he kind of loses his ego and he comes out on the other side uh, as some great magus. Now, this is always something fraught with peril. You know, most people who try and do this just end up, instead of losing their ego, just massively inflating it. But the thing is, the thing that's important for what we're talking about now is it's during this experience that he comes to believe that he had been the Gnostic Simon Magus uh, in a past life. Now, this guy turns up in the Bible in the Acts of the Apostles, and he's, he's quite early in the proceedings. You know, when we think of Gnosticism, we think of, of, you know, maybe end of the first, second century AD, this sort of stuff. This is a period of time during the time of the Emperor Claudius. It's barely a few decades even after the life of, of Jesus, and he's often been come to be known as the first heretic, a rival to Christ, because he's a miracle worker, and he's known, um, you know, to the, the Roman nobles, uh, and he's actually honoured as a living god with a statue erected in Rome. And he was hanging out with a, a, a woman who was a former prostitute uh, who he called Helen, and he had a whole elaborate mythology about who they were in relation to each other, that God's first thought had been female and that this female God had created assorted angels and demigods who in turn created the earth and they rebelled and imprisoned her in the material world and she went through a load of incarnations including Helen of Troy during which the divine female was tortured and humiliated until finally becoming this prostitute and then Simon Magus as God incarnate comes and rescues her. And there are stories about his philosophical teachings, his paranormal powers. And in the end, he has a smackdown with the Apostle Peter in Rome, in which he levitates high in the air, and then Peter dashes Simon Magus to the ground, and, and horribly injured, he, he retires um, a spent force. Now, we only know so much about these characters, but they supposedly engaged in sexual rites involving sperm and, and menstrual blood. And although a lot of later Christian heretic busters are fond of attributing all this kind of stuff to their opponents, you know, I actually feel that this, this seems fairly lightly. And there was um, an essay by the pioneering Gnostic scholar G.R.S. Mead, uh, who put something out on Simon for the Theosophical Society in about 1890. It's quite possible that Jack Parsons would have known about this. But the important thing is, first of all, you know, this establishes beyond any shadow of a doubt that there is a very strong Gnostic coloration here. But when we, we contemplate um, the story of Philip K. Dick as well, this, this starts for me to get very, very interesting because we know that Philip K. Dick, you know, the sci-fi right, we know him for Blade Runner, we know him for Total Recall, and many of us now know that in the mid-70s he had an, a, a very extraordinary extended experience that you could classify as a breakdown or, or a breakthrough. He's on some kind of medication, I think, for a dental problem. Uh, a woman comes around to deliver the medication to him, um, she's wearing uh, about her neck a little um, B 
bit of fish jewellery signifying the fact that she's a uh, Christian. And some light hits this fish and seems to sort of beam into, into Philip K. Dick's brain. And this somehow is the catalyst for sending him off. Um, this you know, a pink beam of light continues to manifest from that point on as if downloading all kinds of data into his brain. And for a while, he goes through this incredible scenario that he as basically living in first century Rome at the same time as 1974 California. He's somehow in both realities with equal vividness. And in Rome, he's this early Christian called Thomas, and he can hear languages that he couldn't speak, and he writes them down phonetically and, and you know, claims that this was later identified as a Greek at the time. One of the most potent indicators that something very strange was going on was that he somehow got some detailed medical information concerning his young son and an undiagnosed, potentially fatal condition that required immediate attention. And, and it turned out when he really insisted on this to medical professionals that this was totally correct and, and it saved the boy's life. So he goes into this weird one. He writes, I think it's 8,000 pages long, this document called Exegesis concerning this experience. And the big theme in it is about the Gnostic Christians and their worldview. You know, that the world's been created by this crazy, cruel deity and is essentially a prison. But a higher level of divinity intervenes in the form of Christ. And he, he uses his terminology, living information, and he calls it the plasma. And it's, it's what we call, would call the Holy Spirit. And this comes into contact with human consciousness. And when a recipient is, is suitably receptive, it, this force would enter and cross bond, as he calls it, creating a hybrid homo plasmate. And he says this annexes the mortal human permanently to the plasmate. We know this as the birth from above or the birth from the spirit. As living information, the plasmate travels up to the optic nerve of a human, to the pineal body. It uses the human brain as a female host in which to replicate itself into its active form. And the whole world can potentially be converted to this. And this energy is the key to escape from the prison and achieve some kind of, of eternal life. Now, in this, this mythology, this understanding that he comes to, he says that the emerging church at that time, the Roman authorities, and it has acted as like antibodies for the body politic, and they hunted down and destroyed any person or thing that showed signs of the plasma. And the last remnant of the energy of limited information was contained in the text that was stashed at Nagamadi in these, in these jars, these manuscripts. And for him, real history stopped at that point. In dormant seed form, he says, as living information, the plasma slumbered in the buried library. And when the material was rediscovered, something was let loose into the world again. There's a, there's a wonderful story about the, the Egyptian peasant who discovered in these, these jars uh, the text that when the lid was taken off, there was all, it, it's, it's just the way the light was shining through the cave and the, and the dust and so on. It was like these sort of sparkling golden forms of dust, like a genie out the bottle just, just came out of it. Now, what Philip K. Dick believed was that somehow or another the plasma had crossed over to California in 1974 and that he was kind of annexed by this plasma then. But here's the thing, you see, the Nagamadi scrolls were discovered in December 1945. It's at that very point that Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard in California are hatching out the Babylon working. It's my contention, basically, um, that this crossed over at, at that point. And to me, one of the, the great proofs of that is that perhaps the most famous of all the texts that discovered at Nagamadi is known as Thunder Perfect Mind. And it's generally associated with Mary Magdalene. It's not presented as being the words of Mary Magdalene, but has come in the current epoch to be associated with her. And it's a female voice. And I'll, I'll just quote a few things and, and I'll, I'll ask listeners to, to recall a little bit of what's already been said by Jung about Abraxas. Sure. For I am the first and the last. 
I'm the honoured one and the scorned one. I'm the whore and the holy one. I'm the wife and the virgin. I am the silence that is incomprehensible. You who deny me, confess me. And you who confess me, deny me. You who tell the truth about me, lie about me. And you who have lied about me, tell the truth about me. For I am knowledge and ignorance. I am shame and boldness. I am shameless. I am ashamed. I am strength and I am fear. I am war and peace. Give heed to me. I am the one who is disgraced and the great one. Give heed to my poverty and my wealth. But I, I am compassionate and I am cruel. Be on your guard. I am the one in whom they call life and you have called death. I am the one whom they call law and you have called lawlessness. And take me to yourselves from places that are ugly in ru and in ruin. I am the union and the dissolution. Now, there's a lot of stuff that Parsons writes. You see, this, this Thunder Perfect Mind was not translated during Jack Parsons' lifetime. None of, these, none of this stuff was known to these guys. Uh, and yet, you know, here's some, here's some words from the Book of Babylon. I am the bride appointed. Come ye to the nuptials. Come ye now. My joy is the joy of eternity, and my laughter is the drunken laughter of a harlot in the house of ecstasy. All your loves are sacred. Pledge them all to me. There's a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, um, that, that Parsons uh, writes about all this. Um, in my book, Alistair Crowley and the Inner Horus, I go into to some detail about it. But it's basically this idea, you know, it's very, very strong that literally uh, as we've come out of the carnage of the Second World War, as we've come out of, of you know, the world-changing events of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, so the Nagamadi scriptures with Thunder Perfect Mind come out of the ground and simultaneously people who are as remarkable and extraordinary as Jack Parsons are moved you know, to, to go through something that they believe will, will bring this force back into the world, that it's, it's necessary. Now, Marjorie Cameron believed, you see, what they were trying to do, uh, the ideal thing was that, that they were trying to get Marjorie Cameron pregnant. She was going to give birth to um, a baby that would be Babylon. She later, this didn't actually happen. She didn't get pregnant. But what, like, what she later believed was that uh, 21 years later, in 1967, the summer of love, you know, the hippies were in effect the children of the Babylon working. And there's also a whole, uh, you know, this is a big topic I won't go too much into, but there's also a belief that they ripped open a port in the fabric of reality. And, you know, the, the beginning of the UFO epoch was in fact connected to this. Uh, Marjorie Cameron did in fact see what we would now call um, a UFO above uh, the mansion where all of this was going on uh, at least a year before all the stuff with Kenneth Arnold and um, Roswell and so on went down so it, it's epic endlessly fascinating stuff and it seems to have you know uh, very much this kind of theme that we can recognize as as the old gnosis returning for the modern world you know and us being invited to somehow, you know, put our minds back to Roman times, to the time of Alexandrian Hermeticism, to the early Christian times, to the kind of people that are around them, and to wonder what states of mind they were in when some of these original texts were composed, because we've now got, you know, the information enough on Crowley, on Jung, on Jack Parsons, to know that this stuff you know, these are prepared and unique vehicles, and this stuff comes out in, in a very distinct altered state. But as I say, it's coming from the same transmitting station, and it's telling us something about the annihilation of opposites, which is a very, very, you know, powerful and difficult thing to work through our culture, where we're so polarised, where, you know, everything has to be one thing or the other. Uh, but somehow or another, something is trying to tell us that there is a liberation um, you know, the, certainly some of the Buddhists and the Advaita Vedanta teachers and, and the devotees of, of the, the powerful Hindu deities like Shiva and Kali, 
you know, they know this territory. You know, these guys really know this territory. We're realizing that that knowledge has always been with us, but it's been kind of rendered subterranean or lost, and we're recovering it because we urgently need it, you know, right now. These are some interesting synchronicities and, you know, Jack Parsons and, and Simon Magus. Personally, I've done a lot of research on Simon Magus and, you know, I'm aware of GRS Mead and the research there. I'm not sure if you were aware of uh, the church fathers had called him Satan. And That's he, right. He's he yeah. um, you know, almost the, the pro-antichrist and it's, it's um, after this particular working in 1948. Yeah, and Jack- then does one of his most controversial things and takes the oath of the Antichrist, uh, which is, you know, clearly as part of um, his, you know, feeling of being connected um, to the earlier figure. And, and his sense of what that means, he produces a manifesto of the Antichrist. You know, we, I think, you know, plenty of people on Christian evangelical websites and so forth would just go completely crazy on, on hearing that a guy has done this. And, but the manifesto of the Antichrist, an end to the pretense of lying hypocrisy of Christianity, an end to the servile virtues and superstitious restrictions, of this, an end to the slave morality, an end to prudery and shame to guilt and sin, for these are the only evil under the Sunday sphere an end to all authority that is not based on courage and manhood, to the authority of lying priests, conniving judges, blackmailing police, an end to the servile flattery and cajolery of mobs, the coronations of mediocrities, the ascension of dolts, an end to conscription, compulsion, regimentation, and the tyranny of false laws. So that's not quite, you know, the way a lot of people would think the manifesto of the Antichrist. That's how Parsons spins it anyway, for better or for worse. Um, the end result is he is a comet, you know, he does go up in flames. He was obviously playing out a very um, finely tuned destiny, should we say. Yeah, and if we think about that, you know, the, the manifesto there, it, it seems along the lines of, you know, Jung's work with the shadow and how he had talked about how it's important for us to embrace our, our dark, dark side, come to learn from the dark side. And, and if each one of us is honest with ourselves, whether you're a Christian out there, no matter your faith, no matter your path, if you're a Gnostic, you're a Libertine, whatever it might be, we all must be honest with ourselves. And we all know everybody's not perfect. Everybody has a dark side and some express it more than others. Some hide it, some lie to themselves, some lie to others about it, you know, but if we're, I believe that's kind of what the message I hear there with the Jack Parsons things, the, the duality of this world where you have one side playing one side and pretending like they're something when they're, they're not. And the whole world finds out it's all a fraud. You know, it's, it's, we all got to embrace the truth, which is we're all both light and dark. Don't you agree? Well, yeah, that's, that's the whole thing about being, being stuck in the extremes. And as, as I say, I think the Hindus have maybe got a, a better handle on it. I mean, in, in Jung's very light work, um, in Eon, he tackles what the major issue of what he considers to be a, a, a terrible rupture in the Western psyche by creating um, the figure of Satan in Christian mythology as as such a complete and utter irreconcilable opposite to to Christ, which he takes to be an image of the perfected self of a capital S, and that somehow or another these have got to be integrated. Whereas, you know, uh, the Hindus in the form of, of a deity like Shiva accept the fact that the dance of Shiva is simultaneously creating and destroying the whole universe. And, you know, that life and death, for example, with Kali and with Shiva, there's far more of a unity. Uh, somewhere along the line, clearly something went very badly wrong in the collective psyche with the Jesus Satan thing. And also with the sense of the divine feminine, you know, the big, big problem that Christianity has had with, with the feminine. And Jung's got quite a bit to say about that and how important it was ultimately when the Virgin Mary was taken up, out, allowed to become Queen of Heaven again and was not just stuck down in the underworld ordeal, uh, you know, with her seven sorrows, uh, as if, you know, the ancient goddess Inanna had never been allowed to come back out of the underworld, as if Persephone had never been allowed to, to return for half the year, that there was something very unbalanced about that. You know, Jung is there with, in his own way with all, all these ideas and um, 
it's not the easiest of raiding, but if, if people are already primed for it, uh, it's well worth it. Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting, you know, in, in religion, if we're to look at the other side of the coin in regards to organized religion in Roman Catholicism now, they're they're having the debate about having married priests and, and women uh, priests when in the beginning there was women priests and there was married priests and so forth. So it's just interesting. Those are the the conversations that are happening now. And then we're having all these fringe, you know, uh, conversations on Twitter where you have just these opposite sides of the spectrum. It, it seems like, you know, we all have all these ideas from all sides of the spectrum. What, what do you see in regards to current events going right now with, with everything as in regards to um, the realm of ideas and this interconnected plane that we're on and, and then all the, the fringe attitudes and how it's being magnified? Well, speaking from Glastonbury with all this history, um, you know, we, we suffered a tremendous um, rendering where at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries and the Protestant Reformation, um, the book that I'm currently writing is a kind of historical investigation, um, you know, primarily in Britain and, and, and in Europe, based on the recent astrological events, the conjunction of Saturn and Pluto in Capricorn and what people were saying about it and what an enormous thing it was going to be. And that the last time it happened was in 1518. And this was um, January 1518 when Martin Luther um, got his 95 theses together and maybe nailed them to the door of the cathedral, maybe didn't, but um, got them circulated increasingly in Europe. The Reformation gets going in this country. Henry VIII does in Spain, uh, makes himself head of the church. All kinds of, of, of carnage happens on the basis of that. The Catholic Church in this country, it, it's kind of interesting. We think of the Catholic Church because of the Inquisition, because of the tyranny, because of the horrors. as some you know, monolithic thing. But the old forms, you know, the gods live on through the cult of the saints. The ancient goddess lives on through the Virgin Mary, and it was grassroots that really drove the cult of the Virgin Mary all the way through. Yes, the, the increasing ascendancy of the cult of the Virgin Mary and the eventual fact that as recently as 1950 was, was when it became official doctrine that she had ascended to heaven. And this came about as a result of an enormous petition that was, was circulated throughout the Catholic world. In this country, we've just had, you know, uh, we've left the European Union. We've got a whole load of uncertainty. What seems to be happening is that older cycles are somehow trying to assert themselves and trying to make us realise they're still there. This country, uh, right now, the Catholic Church in this country, which is obviously not the, the main church, uh, there's not that many compared to the Church of England, but they're about to revive an old medieval practice where they're dedicating the entire country back to the Virgin Mary. And there's been a whole kind of prayer vigil that's been going on for the last week and it's gonna go on for the next couple of weeks. And from one of the biggest uh, Marian shrines in this in this country, a place called Walsingham on March the 29th, they're rededicating as, as the whole country as a kind of dowry to the Virgin Mary. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very strange for me. The main thing at the moment is uh, history is just switched on to the absolute max. I don't know to what extent the same kind of thing can be said over on your side of the pool, but it's interesting now. There's 1518, Pluto and uh, Saturn in Capricorn. It's 1519 uh, that Cortez takes down Montezuma and a whole bunch of enormous historical endings and beginnings, you know, all start to, to play out there. And it's during the same period of time you get all the enormous global voyages of discovery and so on that, that leads to the form of the world that we've got going on now, that the various protests like Extinction Rebellion are saying have got to be reformed. And I, I, I feel that, that what's important is, is to, for me, you know, I've found that being a history freak is very, very useful here, that the, the more you, you plug into every little bit of nuance of information of the amount of things that are coming back round again uh it helps you to kind of see things that other people that are only kind of you know maybe got the last 50 or 100 years in their head uh, are missing and this is where you know this idea of the collective unconscious i've just found myself 
you know, um, being sucked into the slipstream of some of this Virgin Mary Catholic Church stuff. You know, I've always been a bit of a sucker for Virgin Mary visions. I've always found what happened at Fatima to be infinitely mysterious. Uh, I've got some kind of um, resonance with that, regardless of what my intellect and my brain says. You know, the Virgin Mary is a woman who's not a woman. You know, she gives birth without having ever had sex. She gives birth without any physical sensation. She never menstruates. You know, she never suffers. She ascends bodily into heaven. I can't understand any feminist that is, it just absolutely just detests the whole idea of it. But there's some numinosity that's there. Um, you know, uh, I used to have a statue of the Virgin Mary in my back garden. When I had a garden that backed onto the walls of Glastonbury Abbey, I had a whole Marian grotto at the bottom of my garden. I used to sit out there in the summer with like millions of candles everywhere and just go into a state of rapture and somehow all of that is kind of is working through my brain at the moment. So on the one hand, I'm talking about Jack Parsons and Crowley mm -hmm. and on the other hand, I'm writing about, you know, I, the Catholic Church uh, uh, and the cult of the Virgin Mary. So I just accept it. I'm just glad that I haven't got the kind of ideological barriers in my head that tell me that, you know, you, oh, you can't do this or you must do that or this is right and that's wrong. No, it's just what plays out in your consciousness, where the passion and the intensity and, and the application goes is your personal truth. And it's surprising how much unity can be found in all that diversity if you allow it to unfold. An interesting, you know, synchronicity when you talk about Henry VIII when I first started my path and my research, I actually found that my family was involved uh, during that time. They were actually in Paris, France, and involved with the, you know, the Roman Church and making the decisions and so forth. And it was at that time there was, you know, as you had mentioned, the dissolution of the monasteries, and they had a big part in in building essentially that country and that area. And you know, and all of a sudden, in one fell swoop. Henry VIII wipes them out, and then we see this this buildup, and they kind of are reinstituted. We see the the Catholic Church kind of reuniting with the Orthodox Church, where they're they're talking again and the ecumenical work that they're doing and so forth. And then now you're mentioning this, you know, and then at the same time we're hearing in the media this upheavals with the the royal house and and the queen and, and the prince and Prince Harry is losing his royal status. And then well, Prince it, Andrews it, and it's a real strange thing to throw in, into the mix there. Sure. Uh, the, the wedding of Harry and Meghan was on the same date, May the 19th, as the execution of beheading of Anne Boleyn. Now, whoever chose that date, that's profoundly mysterious to me. I don't know to what extent we can say maybe that's a conscious thing on someone's part or I'm, I'm tending to talk about what I call a historical morphing process, that somehow or another when people are conforming to certain archetypes and processes, they just kind of get um, set into certain patterns that are already there and coming back round again. But obviously Prince Harry, his real name is Henry, you know, he even he's a ginger even, he's got a beard now, he even looks, you know, a little bit like Henry VIII. Uh, and, and everything that's happening it's it's profoundly mysterious it, you know I, I can't say that i understand it yet we'll have to see how it plays out but it was a very striking date synchronization that did yeah. seem to suggest to me when it first happened i you know i thought well this isn't going to end well is it yeah well i, I studied uh, the law my understanding is once you you marry someone outside of the royal house and especially from the united states you lose your royal status and that's exactly what's happening now so they're, they're not saying that but that's my understanding. And then he had the Sussex role, which is essentially, you know, you're the king of Freemasonry. Um, and then now that's being lost. So it's, it's all interesting. So yeah, interesting times. For sure. For sure. <laughs> and it does keep, you know, that this is what I find. It is interesting. It's in fact, it's more than interesting. It's exhilarating to just think, you know, even though it's quite frightening, what the hell is going to happen next? What is all this going to look like in a few years time? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And let's, you know, before we, we wrap it up, uh, let's get into the, the, you know, we're talking a little conspiratorial here. Uh, Crowley was involved in, in various things and secret societies. We have the OTO, which Jack Parsons was involved in, and then also Freemasonry. What are your thoughts in regards to those uh, secret societies that they were involved in? And then also the rumors about Crowley involved in various 
three-letter agencies, intelligence agencies? Um, I'm not in any doubt at all about the fact that Crowley would have had some involvement um, with intelligence agencies. Uh, pretty much anybody that was in uh, the public school system that were, went to Cambridge and Oxford uh, would have had connections. People would have been open about them. There's, there's a great agent, a uh, great book called Secret Agent 666, uh, which goes into a, which I've made use of in my Crowley book, which goes into a, a fair amount of detail on that. Now, it, it's also the case with Gurdjieff. You know, I think Gurdjieff was undoubtedly there or thereabouts uh, with various uh, intelligence agencies. The life of Blavatsky intersects with all kinds of political movements, intelligence agencies, all kinds of strange things going on. That's a whole thing unto itself. Now, the, the question is whether it, it necessarily means that they are not um, entirely sincere in the mystical, magical work they're doing. And I think it's one of the useful things for me is to go back to, to the roots of all of this. You know, our, our secret service, our intelligence agencies, our spy network that served the British Empire so well really came you know into its own during the time of queen elizabeth the first and at that time uh, there was a, a work by uh, a german scholar mystic theologian called abbot trithemius called the steganographer uh steganographia and it was on the one hand a very kind of meticulous you might call it a grim world. It gave you all sorts of information about angels and this, that, and the other, and magical procedures. But you could also use it to encode uh, to cryptic messages that you could pass across Europe in such a way that if you didn't know the code, you know you wouldn't be able to understand that espionage messages were being passed from one to another. Now, the famous John Day, uh, you know, it's increasingly well known that he. Uh, was actually involved to a certain extent in all of this, and that he was, in fact, you know, his designation was 007. And many, many years later, Ian Fleming, who was, you know, part of the intelligence agencies, he knew about all this, and, and this was a little thing in the background of his creation of James Bond. And indeed, Fleming, you know, did know Crowley, did have lunch with him, uh, as indeed did, uh, you know, other people in MI6, Crowley had sent letters in right at the start of the war. Uh, he had various appointments with people in naval intelligence, offering up his services. And indeed, you know, when Rudolf Hess was captured, uh, he, he had volunteered um, to interrogate him. And I think one of Ian Fleming's uh, most treasured possessions was a letter that he had from Alistair Crowley um, concerning this. And there's a certain amount of, of you know, contention is there are wonderful stories that maybe Crowley did get to interrogate Hess. Um, Hess, we, we know that something pretty strange happened to his brain in the course of his captivity in the Tower of London when he comes out and is paraded at the Nuremberg trials. Um, he's pretty zombied out. You know, some people believe it's not even Hess, that it's, it's a double. But at one point, in, he's complaining to the Red Cross that he's been fed Mexican brain poison, uh, which is an absolute classic to me because we're obviously going to be thinking this is mescaline. And if there's one guy we know who knows a little bit about mescaline who's somewhere in the vicinity, it is, of course, Alistair Crowley. It's a wonderful, you know, it'd be a great one-act play, uh, you know, to imagine just, just Crowley and Hess in this room uh, together discussing various things and Crowley trying to coax stuff out of him. There are certain stories suggesting that Crowley had done some enormous great ritual um, in order to actually tempt Hess over here and make his, his fatal plane journey. I don't actually believe that. Uh, the way that's pitched doesn't land right with what I know about Crowley. But the idea that he, he's, he is, you know, he's there or thereabouts. To what extent the, the, the use has been made of him, we don't know. But it, it's fascinating stuff. And I, I, I believe that it's possible for people to kind of hold all, be wearing all of these hats, uh, you know, uh, almost at the same time. The, the view, if you go back to Elizabethan time, if you go back to the time of Trithemius, you go back to the time of, of John Dee, these people were believers in the hermetic philosophy. Everything was interconnected. Everything was linked together. Everything was a unity. Everything symbolized everything else. What you, you did 
on a daily basis, the way you did it and the associations that you had could be entirely harmonious. You can hold all of that in place. You know, D is a very political figure. He, he, he believes in the creation of what ultimately becomes the British Empire. You know, he's got a whole mythology of, of King Arthur in his head. He helps create maps for the great Elizabethan seafarers. He, he promotes the ideas of what becomes the British Empire. He sets up the astrology for Queen Elizabeth the first coronation. He can be involved in espionage. He can also be involved in mystical activity and be entirely sincere about that at the same time, as indeed I believe Crowley can be um, and Gurdjieff can be and Blavatsky can be. You know, I'm broadly down with all those people. There are going to be other examples that we might be able to find where it's not quite so... Um, you know, there's more negative connotations, obviously, with uh, the Nazi German side of it. It, it, yeah. it becomes, you know, uh, that's where you see the downside of it. Yeah, in, in my opinion, Paul, I, I researched this thoroughly. And, you know, I, I my take would be that they were on their own paths. And then eventually they had come under the the um, auspices and the identification of the powers that be of their local governments and were watched and then eventually possibly either asked or were recruited either you know join us or just we'll destroy you kind of thing i don't know if it was like that and then what i see i don't see a change in a lot of these people where you kind of see they're involved in something it's as if they just kind of kept doing what they were doing um, even though they might have been involved with these agencies. And then I think a lot of them sometimes fell on hard times and they would approach them for to make some money. You know, I, I don't know if that was the case, but... Yeah, I think certainly with Crowley, <laughs> and times when he's in, in Germany in the 1920s and the very early 1930s before um, the Nazis come to power, he, he's potentially quite useful in terms of the information that he can back, you know, back and forth. Yeah. Um, it's you know some of the people that he met up with and so and I, I can I can you know quite easily uh, accept that all all that goes on and yeah you're right I don't I don't think it ultimately makes a lot of difference um, to their trajectory they're just able quite skillfully to kind of play that and 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 it's just recognised that because they are the unusual people that they are that they are you know an asset if you like yeah that, and. That, that is not going to attract the same kind of attention, uh, you know, as, as a more obvious agent might. Correct. And if we look through time, and I know you made the example of John D. I, I know this goes back, I, I believe, through all eras and aeons and ages that this had happened, and and people that might have been outside of the parliament or the royal court or the the regular secret societies were recruited in, or the same thing can be said. I've researched the the Catholic Church where. There was various Druid priests in, in Celtic Ireland and so forth in Celtic Britain at that time that were Druids and they eventually became converted and Catholics and they were they became saints and, and fathers for the church and so forth. So you see that um, going on and even uh, St. Francis of Assisi, I believe he was a troubadour um, before he became you know a Catholic and then a saint and that's who... Uh, Pope Francis had took his name from. So the, the, the Middle Ages are a lot less monolithic than than people might imagine. There is a tremendous amount going on. There is so much heresy uh, and weirdness, and, and ultimately, you you've just got the triumph of what I call the Gothic Cathedral epoch. You know, the mindset that goes into that. Um, triumphantly expressed in in the last century by the likes of Falconelli. Is, is, is something that is one of the great glories of humanity. But at the same time, you know, I think I've, I've talked about this in a number of my books and talks. Al Spensky in New Model of the Universe draws this distinction between what he calls civilization and barbarism. And civilization has to make use of barbarism in order to survive. You know, and you've got a real dynamic tension all the way through the Roman Empire. You need the Roman army. You know, you, you need some savagery in order to actually create the space where these great triumphs of culture can manifest. You know, it, it's it's not a comfortable thing, but it just happens to be true. And in the early Middle Ages, you know, in the high Middle Ages with the Gothic Cathedral Epoch, you can have these astonishing buildings and what they represent and the whole cosmology that is embodied in them and the whole mysticism of their dedication to the likes of the Virgin Mary. 
And you can also have the Cathars being genocided. You can have the Templars getting busted. You can have a whole bunch of hideous massacres going on with the Crusades. You've got all that stuff. They don't cancel each other out there. You know, you just have to take the whole thing on board to get a, get an understanding and a real feel for it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if we go back to even further, we could say that uh, Julius Caesar had founded those lands there. And then all of a sudden we have the Virgin Mary coming back and we can keep going further and further. But uh, as we are getting closer to the end of this podcast, Paul, what's what's next for you? Do you have another book in the works? Any appearances? Uh, um, quite soon. The book I'm currently writing, History and Myth, is, is stimulated by... Um, the recent Brexit by Boris Johnson becoming Prime Minister, the fact that there are some very strange resonances with Henry VIII and the period of the Reformation, that it set me off looking at 1518 and the time before that of the Saturn um, Pluto in Capricorn was 1284. I started looking at what was happening in Glastonbury and Britain in that period, seeing if there was a unity to it and if I could see things that were coming back round again. And looking at what was going on in Europe, which was a, a, a time of really strange book of revelation, end times, millennial cults, peasants uprisings, weird, crazy ass preachers, uh, you know, the, the take over entire cities and try and, and recreate the, the golden age or the time of the Garden of Eden and end up getting completely massacred, you know, and, and the roots very, very interesting roots that you can find that there's a, a morphological resonance between the myth, what you might call the political mythology of Marxism and the millennial cults of the Middle Ages. It's been initially mapped out by a guy called Norman Cohn in a classic book called The Pursuit of the Millennium. A lot of the stuff that goes on in Europe kind of climaxes at the same period of time uh, as we get our dissolution going. And there are some really strange echoes of that that I can certainly see in this country with the Extinction Rebellion movement. Just seeing what the archetypal forces that are there in the background behind what seems to be a very modern ideology, uh, the whole idea that the world's about to end and, uh, you know, there are a bunch of, of sinners, if you like, that are in the way of the righteous and that the sinners have got to but got out of the way in order for some kind of golden age to be returned. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating study. I've gone into overdrive over that it, it, over the last two or three months now, and I'm getting quite near to the point where I'm going to complete that. Sounds interesting, definitely. And, and some more uh, shameless promotion you've been really giving of your time, Paul. Where can we send people... Uh, for your great work, your books, where is the best place to go? Well, okay, all all of my books are available on on Amazon Kindle. You know that's basically where you'll get them in the United States. Um, most of my books, not all of them, are still available in paperback form in the United Kingdom. I've got my website, paulwestonglastonbury.com, but the, the, whereas I will post videos and my lectures and bits and pieces of news. But when it comes to the books, they're all on Kindle. Yeah. Great. And, and what's a, a good book uh, for people that are listening to this podcast that maybe summarizes everything that we've talked about? Of what I've been saying has all come straight out of my Alistair Crowley and Ian Horus, and there is an enormous amount of other stuff in there concerning um, ufology, the 60s, all sorts. There you go, audience. If you would like to hear more and, and learn more, please support Paul and, and go to Amazon and, and pick up that book. Thank you for your time, Paul. I, I learned a lot. I enjoyed well, it. And my pleasure. Yeah, it's been a good one, Mark. Yeah, definitely. And let's talk again in the future. Okay. Okay, buddy. Take care. All right. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. With the coronavirus wreaking havoc on the world and all the other harmful bacteria, viruses, and molds to worry about, disinfectants and cleaners are selling off the shelves and selling out in stores across the globe. But I have good news for you. There is a special stock of pure hydrogen peroxide disinfecting cleaner waiting just for you, which is one of the most powerful, safest, and greatest products to keep you and your family safe during this virus outbreak. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, recommends you use a disinfectant such as hydrogen peroxide to kill 99.9% .9 of the pathogens like the coronavirus. You can easily buy 
pure hydrogen peroxide disinfectant cleaner online by the gallon or in handy spray bottles today. And if you put in the code 33, you will get 20% off of your order. Again, use code 33 and get 20% off pure hydrogen peroxide disinfectant cleaning products. To get your bottle today, go to purehydrogenperoxide.com. Again, that is purehydrogenperoxide.com.